Hi again then guys and welcome to our very first review of a car of course from the seven new vehicles in the 1.31 update for GT Sport and we're kicking off first of all in review form at least with the McLaren P1 GTR. Very interesting car to add to the game. That's what I'll say first of all because to put my cards on the table I'm not a fan of any version of the McLaren P1 in particular and I'm not a huge McLaren fan in general I have reasons for that including Can-Am days and how they tried to get Chaparral removed etc and kind of succeeded in doing so and then went on to dominate themselves for the same reasons that they claimed Chaparral shouldn't be allowed to race but there you go that's a rant for another time <laughs> as far as their road cars go i have respect for them especially of course the f1 which is arguably still the benchmark of how good a supercar can be especially for its time the p1 though it just didn't do it for me and to be honest the laferrari doesn't either and neither does the porsche 918 i'm not really a fan of any of those i'm much more of a jaguar cx75 kind of guy and of course that isn't exactly an option However, this one, I will say, excites me a lot more, because although the road-going version would most definitely and completely unarguably be a way more useful car to have in the game, because for one thing it would be classified as a road car in N1000, and you could use it for far more races, which would be very cool, plus the added bonus that it would be a lot cheaper, I mean, across the board it just makes more sense to add that one. But they didn't, and that's the funny thing. They did the same thing with Pagani because bringing Pagani back was something which a ton of people, myself included, really wanted. But then they chose the least useful Pagani <laughs> to bring back. It wasn't a Huayra, it wasn't a Zonda, it was the Zonda R. The track-only toy which is illegal for racing, illegal on the road, and is pretty much useless for anything else apart from flexing your car collection, in real life and in the game. The McLaren falls into pretty much the same territory. So why did they add this one? Well, you'd have to ask Kaz, I guess, and the team behind it, but I do think it's kind of a cool choice to go for. For all of its comparative uselessness, compared to the road car at least, it's still a very cool car. Now, 3.6 million is quite a bit, but I would say it's actually worth that, because if you look at cars that debut, especially these hardcore hypercars and supercars, when they first arrive in a game franchise, they typically are more expensive to begin with, and then if they appear later on in the franchise, they get a little bit cheaper over time. As proof of that, for example, think of Gran Turismo 5, when the GT by Citroen race car debuted. It was, what, 10 million credits? By the time we got to Gran Turismo 6, how much was it? 2.5 million? Something like that? 2.2? In fact, I believe it was 2.25. Now in, in GT Sport, it's been reassigned, it's less powerful as a Group 3 car, and it's 450,000 credits. Just two games later, and it's dropped from 10 million to 450,000. So that's what happens. When you have a new car, it will typically be, if it's a cool enough car, more expensive. So to me, 3.6 million is not that much. It's, too, it's appropriate for the car. And compared to something like a Vulcan, for instance, at 3.3, it makes sense to charge that much. It is, however, a full 2 million more than the Zonda, which is hefty, <laughs> to say the least. Now, as far as the spec sheet, the Zonda and the Vulcan are both very impressive. But the McLaren blows them both out of the water. 986 horsepower, of course. From that turbo-aspirated 3.8 litre V8, quite a bit of torque for a McLaren. They're not typically known for that, 607 pound-feet. And the weight is the funny thing. And this is one of the things that I actually respect the most about modern hypercars, especially these track-focused ones, or at least track-biased ones. And that is that they're not that lightweight anymore. There was a period, say in the later 90s to even the late 2000s to some degree, where you would get these supercars and hypercars that were just getting lighter and lighter and lighter. The Hennessy Venom, the Gumper Apollo, the Ascari A10, various others, Nobles for example, even the TVR Speed 12 in the late 90s, the Mosler, tons of examples where they just got ultra, ultra lightweight. And that was what they relied on for a huge amount of how good they were. Now, though, hypercars are getting heavier again. It's kind of like how mobile phones were huge and then they got super small and light and now they're getting bigger again because of what people want from them and the tech that's put inside them. Likewise with cars. Everything is becoming like the Nissan GTR because the GTR used to stand out for being so big and so heavy because it was full of tech. 
but now everyone's doing it. These hypercars are full of tech, full of safety tech as well now, stuff that you have to have by regulation. But the interesting thing, and this is something which engineers and motorsport fans from decades ago, say 20 or 30 years ago, would have probably never imagined, and that is that you could have ended up having a car that was, say, 100 or 200 kilos lighter than its equivalent supercar or hypercar of the time. And yet it would be quicker, because that extra weight was not just extra weight for the sake of it, it was all technological advantages and tech that helps the driver to maximize the car's ability. So it's very cool to see how this, for instance, at 1,345 kilos, which is certainly no flyweight compared to even 10 years ago in the supercar world, it gets the job done. Because it's not just an extra ballast, it's all there for a purpose. That's the lightest that the car could reasonably be with all of this stuff in there. So imagine how much heavier it would be if it were, for instance, a luxury version. However, the horsepower per ton is still 733 because the power itself is so high. Now, in terms of racing, it's not that useful, let's be honest, you know, Group X. You've got some usability there with a number of them, but overall, nowhere near as much use as you could get out of the road version. And of course, I've, I have to briefly mention the main issue that I have with this car and the Zonda, and that is actually, contrary to what many people might believe, it's not that they're in Group X. I actually think that this is correct to be in Group X. It should be there. And a lot of people are probably surprised to hear me, of all people, say that because of my frequent disdain for Group X. But it's not Group X that I have a problem with. I agree with it. It's a great class to have for stuff like the Tomahawks and Red Bulls. It's just the way it's used that annoys me, because there are cars that flat out don't deserve to be in there, like the Tesla. However, I think that this one does, because it's way too good to go up against road cars, but it also doesn't fall neatly enough into any racing category, because it's got the power of an LMP, but it's nowhere near as quick as an LMP. So it's way too good for Group 3, makes no sense in Group 2, and Group 1 it's not quick enough because it's too heavy, and it's more of a hypercar than a full-on prototype. So it, it doesn't fit anywhere. So of course, that's the point of Group X, cars that don't fit anywhere. However. The Vulcan is the problem, and I'd heard some people saying that the Vulcan had been reassigned to Group X for this update. I got pretty happy about that, but it hasn't. It's still in N800, so I'm not sure where people were getting that idea. But overall, it's the Vulcan that gives me the issue, because it's just not fair. And for those people who love to say, oh, there was a road-going version of the Vulcan made later on, I'm well aware of that. EDO competition will build you essentially an FXX on the street. That doesn't mean that Ferrari ever did. Aston Martin and whoever it was who owned that car made it into a street car. It was not a street car to begin with. The Vulcan is a track toy. So there is no sense whatsoever in having something like a Vulcan as a road car and then having the Zonda and the McLaren in Group X. It's simply not fair. Now we may do a rivals match still between them just to see what they're capable of against each other, but let's be honest, you already know the result. This McLaren's gonna wipe the floor with both of them because although it shares similarities, it's just streets ahead, and for all of the lack of love that I have for McLaren and for most of their models, I have more than enough respect to say that I do believe that the P1 and this P1 GTR, as this example goes, is definitely worthy of being a successor to the McLaren F1, because the reason why the McLaren was so good, and the reason why it still feels good and sounds good today, is because it was that far ahead of its time. That is what McLaren tried to do with this car again, and I think that they succeeded, because this essentially feels like what the hypercar class at Le Mans could end up being like, albeit with some changes, of course. So overall, I think that this is a fantastic car in terms of the way it drives, the way it looks, the way it sounds, the performance is strong. Here on the Nordschleife, I got it up around 232 miles per hour, and that's with full downforce. This car's a monster. Just don't buy it expecting to use it in all forms of racing, but I would definitely still say it's worth buying because it's just a really fun car to drive and a viscerally fast one. But that is it for this review. Of course, I will be doing a tune for this car as well, probably tomorrow. So I'll see you guys then for that. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.